Let's turn in our Bibles to John chapter 6, where we were reading earlier. We're going to talk about Jesus, the bread of life today. This whole chapter in John 6 is all about bread, from the beginning to the end. And Jesus, in this chapter, says some very interesting things that are hard to understand sometimes. Some people call them the hard sayings of Jesus. If you made a list of those hard sayings, this would be in the list. So let's ask God to bless our time as we get started. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have promised to vi visit with us today by your Spirit, wherever two or three are gathered in your name, there you are in the midst, you said. So we welcome you and we consider these words that you spoke many thousand years, thousands of years ago in Capernaum and uh, we ask you to give us light and understanding and wisdom and skill in comprehending the things you wrote in the scriptures. Like you did for your disciples on the road to Emmaus, we pray that you would open our understanding that we would understand the scriptures and that you would give us every measure of grace that we need to believe and to walk with you. We thank you for your Holy Spirit who you sent to teach us and to lead us to you, our minds and thoughts to you. We welcome you, Holy Spirit, to visit, to work in our midst today in each heart and mind, those that are present, those that are online. We pray, Lord, that you would protect us from the evil one who comes to steal the word and snatch the seed and we pray that you would deliver us from all his devices to distract and confuse and deceive. And we pray that instead your spirit would give light and understanding. We ask for these blessings in the name and through the blood of Jesus. Amen. So first we had the feeding of the 5,000, which was probably a lot more than 5,000. And the people trying to find Jesus. And it says that they took shipping and they came to Capernaum which as we said is at the north of the Sea of Galilee way up at the top and it was a uh, fishing village where there was a lot of fishing trade and commerce so it might have had some interesting smells if you went there but uh, Capernaum was a place that was sort of a base of Jesus ministry he went there a lot he went to the synagogue a lot and it it says they found him on the other side of the sea and then it says in verse 59 that he said these things in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. So is it saying that they, when they found him, he was in the synagogue at Capernaum? Maybe. Because the conversation is all taking place continu continuously. There's no break in the conversation. So perhaps they did find him. Perhaps it was the Sabbath. And perhaps the people were gathered at the synagogue and Jesus was speaking to them there. But let's take a minute to go back and review where we are. We're in the Gospel of John, the Apostle John, and let's try to understand what John's doing here in including this in his testimony. What is John trying to do in his Gospel? Well, he's trying to be a true witness. He was an eyewitness, firsthand eyewitness, to everything that Jesus did as he walked on the earth, and he's trying to tell us what he saw. He wants us to know what he saw. And John is deeply committed to his role as an eyewitness. I've wondered to myself, did it reach the level of a passion? Was this something John was passionate about? I have to wonder if it wasn't because it, it comes out again and again as he writes in his gospel, in his epistles, in the book of Revelation. He keeps bringing up this uh, topic of bearing record and faithful witness and true testimony. And so... <clears throat> I don't believe there are any lies in the Gospel of John. I believe that everything that you're reading there is a man telling us the truth, completely telling us the truth about what he saw Jesus say and do. And so, think about this. What's happening in this story, the big picture is that the Messiah has come to Israel after thousands of years of waiting and prophecy. So, I think we could say, is this the greatest event of all time I think from the Jewish people's perspective it was the greatest event of all time I mean what were they looking forward to more 
than that their Messiah would come. And so I think from John's perspective, there's nothing more important than that the people get a true report of what happened. Uh, this, this is a, the magnitude, the weight of this event had to be so powerful. And we emphasize this because John emphasized it. If you, if you start in John chapter 1, <clears throat> he keeps talking about the testimony of John the Baptist. John was sent for a witness. He came to bear witness. Uh, John bear witness of him and cried. And then if you go to his epistle, 1 John, this topic, he starts out again with his whole concept of being the witness. And he says, that which was from the beginning, John 1, 1 John 1, 1, which we have heard, he's telling what he heard, which we have seen with our eyes. He's saying, I'm a witness. I heard this with my ear. I saw this with my eye, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled. He said, I touched him. I've, I've touched Jesus. I've handled him of the word of life. For the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness. He's saying, I'm doing the job of a witness. I bear witness and show you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye may have fellowship with us. And so he starts the Gospel of John with this idea of a witness, somebody bearing witness. He starts his epistle and then you go to Revelation and John was always humble. He, he never says his own name in his gospel. He says, you know, the disciple that Jesus loved. Or, you know, he, he, in, he refers to himself in these humble ways without using his own name. And then when you get to Revelation, he calls himself John. And uh, he identifies himself in this way. In the book of Revelation 1.1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show to his servants the things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Now John's going to... Which John? There was lots of Johns, right? There was John the Baptist and John the Apostle and there was lots of other Johns. Who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. That's John's self-identification. I'm the guy who bear record of what I saw. So it's consistent all the way through and I think it's funny, not funny, it's sad when people come and try to say that John didn't write the book of Revelation. Well, it's like, it's pretty obvious. He's telling us who he is. <laughs> He's the one that bear record. And, and so this, this is um, like an epoch making moment in the history of Israel, right? This is, this is going to be, uh, you know, that moment in history where everything changes because the Messiah has come. And this was prophesied to Eve that the seed would come. And it was prophesied to Abraham, to Moses, to David. It was prophesied by Isaiah and all the prophets. And it, it's hard for us to sit here and comprehend um, the magnitude. It, it, okay, it would be like this. It would be like somebody coming to church today and say, did you know Jesus came back yesterday? <laughs> you know? That's the magnitude, right? We're all saying, we're expecting the second coming of Jesus. And in my traditional Baptist church growing up, it was like, you know, any minute, any day, you know, <laughs> could happen tomorrow, you know. Um, and there was a lot of emphasis on the second coming of Christ. Well, this was his first coming. And these people Imagine what it would have been like going to somebody and say, guess what? We found the Messiah. He's here. That's basically what John and the other guys are doing. They're going around telling people, we found the Messiah. And what are people going to say? Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, really? Honestly? Where? I don't believe you. Show me. Let's go see. Show me the proof. Where is he? I want to see for myself. And they go and they see Jesus and they see an ordinary man. Remember we talked about that. He was an ordinary man in appearance. He didn't stand out in the crowd. And so they see this ordinary man. And then in this passage today, what? We know his parents. We know his father and mother. Isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph? How can he say I came down from heaven? And so this was causing a stir, right? 
And so John knows that people need to know the truth. If it's true, they need to know it. If it's false, they need to know it. And so he was motivated, highly motivated and committed to telling the truth. Thousands of Jewish families at this time were living with longing. They were living with earnest, heartfelt, deep longing for their Messiah. They were under the oppression of the Romans, and the oppression was getting worse. If you want to understand that period of history, it's best to read the books and the writings of Josephus, and it'll bore you with all the details, but that's the price you pay to get some understanding. Uh, these people were longing for freedom from the Romans. And for them, the coming of the Messiah equaled freedom from the Romans. That's how they viewed it. So there was a lot of tension in the air. There was this tension of the Romans constantly picking on and doing despiteful things to the Jews. They knew how to offend them. And some of these kings did it on purpose. And so the whole populace is a buzz, and there's this almost electrical atmosphere of expectation. Where is our Messiah? When is he coming? When is he going to deliver us? And so then, then you have in the first part of the book of John, the Gospel of John, you have John the Baptist. It starts with the message of John the Baptist. And many of the great events in Jewish history were closely connected with the ministry of a prophet. When they were doing the wrong things, God would send them a prophet and say, turn. And right before the destruction of Jerusalem by the king of Babylon, there was a prophet, Jeremiah. And, and so these epoch-making moments in history were tightly connected with the message of a prophet. And the tradition in the Jews' history was people didn't appoint themselves prophets. Nobody appointed themselves a prophet. Nobody knew who would be a prophet. The word of the Lord would come to a person and they would go tell people what God said and they were a prophet. They didn't choose it. Some, many of them didn't want it because they knew that almost all the prophets died at the hands of the people that they brought the message to. So, you know, when God comes to you and said, this is my word, go deliver it to the people, you're in fear and trembling like Joe was talking about. You're in terror because, you know, you have this message and you've been assigned by God to be a prophet. But in this book, when we're in John, there's no, re there's no record in the Bible of a prophet between Malachi and the New Testament. There's, they're called the silent years, 400 years. Now, were there some prophetic words in a minor way here and there? I don't know. But the scriptures is basically giving us this long period, 400 years of silence. And then when you read in Luke, when he says, um, I'll read it just for emphasis. Luke chapter 3, he goes into this great detailed description of exactly when this happens. The 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate, blah, blah, blah. He's telling who's in charge of what. And then he says, the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. That is a dynamite explosive moment. It's just a little verse here, and you read right over it, and you don't realize that the word of the Lord came to a prophet after 400 years of silence. This is a big deal. This is a big event. And God gave them John who fit the traditional stereotype of a, of a Jewish prophet. You know, he's in the deserts eating locusts and wild honey. We would say he was an ascetic. He didn't care about the pleasures of life, the comforts of the flesh and the natural body. He's living in camel's hair. Have you ever lived in camel's hair? <laughs> you know? and, and he's out here in the desert and uh, he's, he, he's not a man who's into food. You know, just give me some more honey and, and locusts and I'll be okay. You know, he, he's not the kind of person that's um, having a party lifestyle, focused on having a good time. He's not, he's not drinking wine. He's fasting. And so he comes and he has the looks of a prophet. This big beard and this strong voice. And, and he's everything the Jews imagined a prophet to be. They can't deny that this is a prophet. It's, it's so obvious. And so John comes. He's rough. He's coarse. He's bold. He's not afraid of anybody. He has no respect to persons. He's even telling the Roman king, you know, you shouldn't have married that woman. <laughs> you know, he doesn't care what the consequences are. He's speaking to everyone the truth. And God sent him to be the forerunner. The prophecy of his father Zacharias is that he would go before the Messiah to proclaim him. 
And so God sent John as the one to announce to the children of Israel who their Messiah was. And also to prepare their hearts for the Messiah. They weren't ready. They needed to repent. His, his message was, look, God's ready to give you your, your Messiah, but you're all out there doing your own thing, in your sins, in your iniquity. You need to repent. You need to get your heart right. Because God's going to give you the Messiah. And John and Jesus were related, okay? You remember that Elizabeth was Mary's cousin. So John and Jesus are the children of cousins. So they're in the same clan, the same family. If you know anything about Middle Eastern culture, that's a very tight-knit group. Uh, the extended family, the clannishness, the connectiveness. And so does John know who Jesus is? Yes. Does Jesus know who John is? Yes. How much time did they spend playing together, growing up? Who knows? They were part of the same clan, the same family. When Jesus went to Jerusalem when he was 12 with his parents, was John in that group with his parents? We don't know. But... When, when you hear the testimony of John the Baptist in the beginning of a, a book of, of John's gospel, what does he say about Jesus? He says, I knew him not. What do you mean, John, you knew him not? He's, you know, your mom and his mom are cousins. How, how can you say you don't know him? He says, I knew him not. Mary had stories to tell about her birth. Uh, the shepherds had come telling about the angels. Uh, Elizabeth had stories to tell about John's birth. Did John and Jesus not overhear these stories growing up? I'm sure they heard these stories. How can John say, I knew him not? John is not proclaiming Jesus as the Messiah of Israel based on his family ties, based on these family stories, based on these uh, traditions that came through their family. John's waiting for a word from the Lord. He's a prophet. He can't just go out there and say, yeah, I, I know. I've heard those stories. I'm pretty sure that's the one. No, he's waiting for a word from the Lord. And he gets a word from the Lord. And the Lord tells him, the one you see the Spirit descending on like a dove and remaining, that's the Messiah. Well, that happened to Jesus when John was baptizing him. And he came up out of the water and the Spirit descended. And John's, John says, then I knew. Th this is when John has liberty to say, this is the Messiah. He says, I knew him not. John, Gospel John 1 31, I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending on him from heaven like a dove. And I knew him not. Verse 33, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said to me, upon whom you shall see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same as he which baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I saw and bare record that this is the Son of God. So, so now John has liberty to pro proclaim. Not based on his mother's family connection, the stories, but based on this word from the Lord. And so he goes out the next day and he says, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Now, in the story, it doesn't seem like there's massive crowds there. It doesn't seem like there's hundreds of people who got the point. It's just focusing on John and his companion, Two disciples, John 1, 37, two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus. So this was the beginning. John's announcing to everybody, okay, Israel, here's your Messiah, the Lamb of God. And two people follow Jesus. Not a very big impact, right? Why aren't there hundreds? Why aren't there thousands? Well, <clears throat> this was God's way. This was God's plan. So to run around Israel in those days telling people you had found the Messiah, this wasn't actually unheard of. This had happened before. It happened fairly frequently, actually. False messiahs would rise up. Why? Because you have this incredible communal desire for the Messiah to be manifested, and so some person takes advantage of that attitude and that expectation and comes along and says, okay, I'm the Messiah, follow me. And so... A man going around through the Israelite communities telling other men, follow me, that was done. That was something that had happened. And if you want the, the particulars of the story, you go to Acts chapter 5 and you have this man Gamaliel when they're having judgment against Peter and John. They brought him into the court. They listened to Gamaliel because he was in repute of being a wise counselor and usually when he spoke, nobody else had anything better to say. So he speaks last, and when, 
when he gets up to speak, he says, he basically says, don't fight against this movement. If it's not of God, it'll die out on its own, like these other men before. And then he names those men. So if you go to Acts chapter 5, verse 35, Gamaliel says, Ye men of Israel, be careful what you intend to do is touching these men. Be for before these days, before the days of Jesus, be, I mean, this is, this is right after Pentecost. So this is these days, meaning the days of Jesus. Before those days, rose up Thutis, boasting himself to be somebody. Boasting himself to be what? Boasting himself to be the Messiah. <laughs> Claiming he was the one that was going to save Israel and deliver them from the Romans. Whom a number of men, about 400, joined themselves. What were those men doing? They bought into the lie. They believed, ah, Thutis, you're the Messiah. Yes, I believe. I'll follow you. Where's the sword? Let's go get Rome. Who was slain and all as many as obeyed him were scattered and brought to nothing. After this, rose up Judas of Galilee in the days of the taxing and drew away much, much people. What's he doing? He's also claiming to be the deliverer, the savior. And drew away much, much people. What are they doing? Oh, well, it wasn't Thutis. Maybe it's Ju Judas of Galilee. Let's go. Get the weapons. Let's go get Rome. God will do a miracle. Hurrah. Well, they also perished and everybody was dispersed. So, so when Jesus comes and he's selling Peter or James or John or Andrew and he says, follow me, this is uh, something that's happened before by other people. But all those came to nothing. Most of those men were... All of those men who had come trying to lead the, the country in revolt against Rome were, were false. So Israel's full of political turmoil and military oppression. The military are on the streets. And if you've watched any of the movies, the Jesus film or whatever, they portray these soldiers because the Roman Empire had a hard time with the Jews. The Jews were troublemakers. The Jews were always rising up and having protests and causing rebellions and being ungovernable and prone to these outbreaks of violence and they were a thorn in the flesh for the Roman Empire and had been for a long time. They would not submit to the Roman Emperor. They believed that Jehovah was God and so they didn't fit in with the Roman culture. They didn't adapt to the Roman culture. They were anti-culture. And they just wanted to be left alone. They wanted the Romans to leave and get out of their land and, and let them follow God the way they wanted. So in the midst of all this turmoil and hubbub, how is God supposed to introduce the real Messiah? When you've had these fakes coming along before, is Jesus supposed to just start walking down the streets and saying, okay guys, I'm here, hoy, I'm here, Messiah, look, look, <laughs> it's me, I came, the one you've been waiting for, look over here. Hey, Israelites, whoo, it's me. <laughs> is that how he's supposed to do? How, how's God going to announce, how is he going to get the point across that the Messiah is here? And I, I want you to really take this point to heart. There was a courtesy in the way God brought this message to the children of Israel. There was a gentleness in God's approach. There was, a, there was an etiquette, if you will, a politeness in the way God went about quietly, behind the scenes, introducing Jesus to the community as the Messiah. God did it in a humble way. And there were, there were reasons for that, many reasons probably. One of those reasons was that if the kings of the Romans had known who Jesus was, they would have set about to destroy him. Like they tried to do, like Herod tried to do when he was just a baby. And so there was a little bit of a stealth there was a strategy of security that God was managing. He had, to, he had to bring forth the Messiah in the midst of this political chaos. And so how did God do it? Well, he didn't have a big campaign and gather thousands of people at, a, at one of the Colosseums and bring Jesus in with pomp and fanfare. He used word of mouth. One person would spread the word to another. And you saw that in the very beginning of John's Gospel when John and went and Andrew, John and Andrew went and found Simon Peter and they went and found Nathaniel. And so very quietly this word of mouth began to spread. And then Jesus started 
quietly at a wedding behind the scenes, no pomp and fanfare. He just made some water into wine. And his disciples were like, whoa, this is a miracle. This is validating the message that Jesus is claiming to be the Messiah. And so God did send John to be the announcer. But Jesus is always pointing out to the Jews, why don't you believe John the Baptist? He, he, told, he told you, he gave a witness that I'm the Messiah, why don't you believe John? And so there were two basic witnesses that God had. He had the ministry of John the Baptist and he had the miracles that Jesus did. And those two witnesses were the basis of God challenging the whole nation to believe that Jesus was the Messiah. And so John the Baptist fulfilled his role. He helped the people get ready. He got their attention. And then he announced to them who their Messiah was. So as we, as we move forward in the Gospel of John, this message that the Messiah is here is starting to be more widespread. More people are running into Jesus. More people are seeing his miracles. This miracle of feeding the 5,000, that was a big m moment, a big event. And you can imagine you have 5,000 people going home and telling their family and friends what happened that day, right? <laughs> so now you have this, this live wire grapevine going, bzzz, you know, <laughs> and this word is getting out. The Messiah is here. And so these 5,000 men are convinced that Jesus is the Messiah because they, they were fed and they decide to make him king by force. So God is having to manage this fleshly excitement and tamp it down and keep it under control. That's not a worthy motive for following the Messiah. And so Jesus is ha actually having to put forth challenges that will separate between people who are following him genuinely and people who are following him out of their fleshly motive of, of their belly. I want more bread. And so he's putting forth these hard, strong words that are kind of designed to separate the wheat from the chaff. And in this story you'll read in the end of the chapter, from that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Why did they go back and no no more walk with him. Well, verse 60, many of his disciples when they heard this said, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? In other words, who can receive it? Who can believe it? And they murmured and they, and they left. You know, this crowd that was following him because of their, hung, their physical hunger was a dangerous crowd. They, could, they, they would likely be fickle. Today they would be pro-Jesus and tomorrow they would be anti-Jesus. Because all they have motivating them is this natural desire for food. And so when you read these words that Jesus speaks in John 6, this is the best thing that Jesus could have said to them to help them understand the truth. This is Jesus loving them in exactly the way that they needed to be loved. He's saying exactly the words to them that they need to hear so that they can come to faith. And so... It's an amazing passage. It's a lot of um, uh, seemingly confusing things that Jesus is saying. But what Jesus is saying in this chapter, he's using the analogy of bread, as we talked about, the physical bread versus the spiritual bread. And for the Jews, this was a well-known metaphor. It's all through the Old Testament. You can find passages in... Uh, Leviticus 26, Psalm 105, Ezekiel 4, where it talks about bread with this term, the staff of life, or the staff of bread. So a staff was a stick. When you walked, you walked with a staff. If your health was poor or your back was weak, you would lean on your staff, and the staff held you up. And so bread was considered the support of the community. It's what people lived on. It's what they leaned on and depended on to live, was the bread. Just like a person leans on a staff. And if the staff broke, the person would fall. And if the, if the bread was gone, society would fall. And so we saw this play out in the story of Joseph when he was in Egypt at the time of the famine. So the word bread is used in this context 
to represent all of our food, not just our bread. So when it says bread, it's using bread because that was probably the most common staple food, something people ate every day, and it represents the sum of all that is eaten. So it's an inclusive term. It's including all of our food. It's like an emblem of what could be eaten. Jesus said when he taught us to pray, give us this day our daily bread. Well, what about our ham and our cheese and our baked beans and our broccoli and our salad, right? Well, when it says give us this day our daily bread, it's understood that all that stuff's included. So everything on our table is included in this term bread. And so when we get to this chapter, the Jews bring up this concept of being fed manna in the wilderness. What was manna in the wilderness? Manna was what the people depended on to live. If there had been no manna, the people would have perished with hunger. And so God fed them this bread when they were in the wilderness. It appeared at night miraculously. When they woke up in the morning, it would be there. God didn't put it in their jars for them. He made them go out and fetch it every day. They had a part to do. And so manna was what sustained them in the wilderness. And so when Jesus uses this term bread, he's using it in this manner. He's describing himself as that which sustains life and that which has to be partaken of to sustain life. Bread doesn't do you any good if it sits on your table and you don't eat it. You have to partake of it. You have to eat it. And so Jesus is making this powerful application of this analogy of bread to himself and he's applying it to spiritual life instead of physical life. And this is where he's using these words, they're understanding them as if he's talking about physical bread, he's meaning as if he's talking about spiritual bread, so they're totally confused. So they tell, tell Jesus, our fathers ate manna in the desert as it is written. They're quoting scripture to Jesus. They're, on, they're dealing with Jesus on his terms. <laughs> the devil did the same thing in the wilderness, in the temptation. But they're, they're quoting a verse. He's, and he doesn't deny that their fathers ate manna, but he denies that manna was bread from heaven. They said, our fathers ate manna in the desert as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. That's a quote from Psalm 78. It talks about in the Psalms, God gave them angels' food. That's what it says <laughs> in the Psalms. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you like to have tasted manna? I, I would love to go back in a time machine and taste some of that, right? That, that would be awesome. I think it's angel food cake. <laughs> oh, angel food cake. Okay. Well, they said it, you know, they tried to describe it. You know, the word manna means what is it? They didn't know what it was, so they said, what is it? Yeah. Anyway, it, it talked about it a little, being a little, what, what did it say? A little sweet and with a, like coriander seed or something? Anyway, Jesus saying, he's making the point, they're, they're focused on physical bread, right? And he just fed them in this miracle. That's the context. And, and they remember, wow, God fed us in the wilderness. Here's Jesus. He's feeding us. Is he the Messiah? And so they're like, what sign are you going to show us to prove that you're the Messiah, so that we'll believe. And they know, they know what the, what the import of this is. What sign do you show us that we may see and believe, right? Jesus is challenging them to believe that he's the Messiah. And they know that that's what he's challenging them to do. So, so show us a sign so that we might believe. I mean, he just did show them a sign, right? <laughs> but they want something more. And, um, so Jesus denies that manna was bread from heaven. He says, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven. What? What bread did Moses give them? Jesus says it wasn't bread from heaven. Why? What's the proof that Moses did not give you bread from heaven? He says it several times. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. If you had eaten bread from heaven... Your, if your parents had eaten bread from heaven, true bread from heaven, they would still be alive. They would have gotten eternal life from the bread from heaven. But 
Your parents ate the manna in the wilderness and they all died, so obviously that wasn't bread from heaven. Because bread from heaven is life-giving. It gives life. And so Jesus starts describing to them what the true bread from heaven is. And I like this word true. I've always liked this word. Uh, I did another fresh review of it when I came to it here. This is a Greek word. And I really encourage you to get your concordance and do these studies. It, it's really, really beneficial, valid, good stuff. Uh, it's number 227 in the Greek, alethes, and 228 alethanos, both adjectives. And if you look in your concordance and you go to the New Testament references of the word true, you're going to see this 227 and 228 in the column popping up back and forth, back and forth, multiple times. One is, they're both used over 25 times. Interchangeably, it seems. But they both come from the same root. And it's good to study the etymology of the word. How many children know what etymology means? Anybody know what etymology means? Well, that's what you find in a dictionary when it gives you the root of the word. What language it came from, the Latin or the Greek. And so, it's very important to study the etymology of a word. Where did it come from? What words were put together to make this word? So when we come to this word, alethes or alethnos, it's in the Greek two parts. The A and then lethos. Well, the A in the Greek is the negative. It means no or not or against, anti. And so, for, for many of us, we are familiar with other words like atheist. What, is, what does this word mean? Well, a means not or no. And theist is from the word theos in Greek, which means God. So if somebody is an atheist, that means they don't believe in God. The word atheist means no God. They believe there is no God. Or we might come across this word, well, I'm not an atheist, but I'm ag agnostic. It's another Greek word. The a means no, or not, or against. Gnosis means knowledge. So an agnostic, they're not an atheist who says, I don't believe in God. They don't believe they can know whether or not there is a God. And so we come to this word, alethes or alethanos. Well, this word lethos means to conceal. And so when you have the A added to it, it means to not conceal. Something that's not concealed. Something that's revealed. Now, one of the traps you can get into in trying to study these meanings of words is that you can make the etymology the meaning. So that's, that's not correct. The, the etymology is where the word came from, but the meaning of the word can be different from the root. And so when you take this word not concealed, alethes, this is the word in the Greek that means true, and it has the connotation of something that's real, something that's genuine. The actual thing that corresponds to what is represented by the word. So, when Jesus says, My Father giveth you the true bread from heaven, that's the word there. This, the real bread, the genuine bread, the actual thing that corresponds to reality. And so, this is a powerful statement. He's saying, what you eat at your table every day is not true bread. That's not real bread. What your fathers ate in the wilderness, manna, that wasn't true real bread either. Real true bread is what my father gives you from heaven because if you ate of real bread, it would give you life. It would actually sustain you in your spiritual life. And so, this is confusing to the Jews. They're not used to thinking on these terms. They're not used to thinking this deeply. And they can't get their minds wrapped around what Jesus is talking about. But Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He that comes to me will never hunger. He that believes on me will never thirst. Jesus keeps telling them how to partake of the bread from heaven. You come to Jesus and you believe. That's how you partake. But they're still thinking of putting it in their mouth. And so they're bewildered. They're not getting it. And Jesus connects this, interestingly, four times in the passage. He connects it to the resurrection. So what is Jesus saying? Whoever believes on me 
We'll never hunger. We'll never thirst. And I will raise him up at the last day. Well, what is he saying? Yes, you're going to believe in me. You're going to come to me and believe in me. And your physical body is going to die. You're going to be just like your parents who died in the wilderness. You're going to die. But I'll raise you up at the last day. And he repeats this statement. Raise it up at the last day in verse 39, verse 40, verse 44, and verse 54. So Jesus is explaining things very well, even emphasizing the point four times, but they're still not getting it. Jesus quotes the Old Testament in his temptation in the wilderness, saying, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So physical bread supports physical life, and God knows that, so Jesus taught us to pray and ask for our physical daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. But physical life is not enough. We are spirits living in bodies. The body has to be sustained by bread, but the spirit has to be sustained by the word of God. Keeping the body alive is not enough. We must also keep the spirit alive. So you can eat really good bread, and, and if anybody here loves bread, uh, let's talk about bread because I love my bread. I'm not supposed to eat bread anymore, but I love my bread. And um, I love all kinds of bread, every variation I've ever uh, met, I've enjoyed. And um, there is a wonder in the world of all the different flavors and textures and grains and things that can be made into bread. We even have people marketing Ezekiel 4.9 bread. I'm sure many of you have had that. Very interesting things. Bread. The French can talk for two hours about the qualities of the crust of the bread. That's why they make the loaves long, so it's almost all crust and there's nothing else <laughs> they have to eat because they love the crust, right? So, we love bread. But no matter, even if we ate the best organically grown bread, we're still going to die. So Jesus is talking in this passage about living forever. And Jesus brought this perspective to the earth when he came. He brought the heavenly eternal perspective with him. He looked at everything from the eternal perspective. Everybody's busy looking at it from the physical and he keeps bringing in but the eternal perspective is and he would talk about things from that perspective. So what kind of bread will support eternal life? What kind of bread will sustain you after you die? How about making sure that after you die you'll still live in the next life and not perish? Jesus is saying that the true life is not in this physical world, but in the spiritual world. How many of you have ever seen a person that was dead? Have you been to a funeral? Have you seen somebody in a coffin that was dead? I, I did when I was 21 years old. My father died. And they had the viewing. And I went up to the casket and I looked at the body and I said to myself, he's not here. He is risen. <laughs> I knew my dad was in heaven with the Lord. He was not there. That was my dad's body, but that's all there was. I just knew that he was gone, not present. And so, <clears throat> if you take our spirit out of our body, what do you have? Nothing. The body will go back to dust, return to the earth. And so Jesus is saying, what about your spiritual life? Where's the bread for your spiritual life that's going to sustain you into eternity? And he says, I am that bread. And you need to partake of me. If you want to live forever, you need to partake of me. And he tells them how to partake, but they miss the point. Come to me and believe in me. So just like your body has a mouth for taking in bread, our spiritual life has a way to partake of and receive spiritual things. And it's not by eating it. It's by faith. It's by believing. And so, Jesus is challenging them throughout this passage to believe on him as their Messiah. Jesus is saying to the crowds, I want you to do more than just feed your belly and keep your body alive. I want to make sure that when you die and your spirit goes to God that you're going to survive the judgment and live forever. And for that to happen, you need to be forgiven of your sins so that God will accept you. 
and not condemn you to separation from God forever. If you want to live, you need me. You need my body and my blood to be sacrificed for you. And so when we get to verse 51, this is a pretty good, seems like a clear explanation of what Jesus is talking about. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh which I will give for the life of the world. Now, he does not use the word sacrifice in his sentence. But he's implying that he is going to be sacrificing his body, his flesh, his blood for the life of the world. But the Jews strove among themselves. That's a pretty strong word, strove. They were arguing. They were having heated, passionate arguments. What does he mean? He means this. No, he can't possibly mean that. Oh, you don't know anything. I think he means this. You know, they were, there was this striving among themselves. They want to believe that he's the Messiah, but how can he give us his flesh to eat? I mean, he's talking about cannibalism, right? This is weird. This is, it's getting really gross, you know? They're, they're imagining munching on Jesus, you know? They, they, they don't get it. And instead of trying to be uh, more explanatory, Jesus gets worse. He says, truly, truly, I, I say, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Oh, come on. This is... <laughs> You know, this is getting more preposterous as, as, he, as he talks. And he keeps saying the same thing. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed and my blood is drink indeed. Wow, Jesus. <laughs> this isn't very helpful. It's getting worse. It's not getting better. Well... I want to ask you uh, if you've ever seen a shadow. How many people have seen a shadow? Uh, did you ever play with your shadow? Did you ever have a walk at the sunset and you try to stomp on each other's shadow? I have. I like to do that with my kids. I mean, they can't, don't let it stomp on them, but don't let them stomp on me, you know. Uh, how many of you ever did um, little hand shows with shadows against the wall? Make a goose. And some people are really good at it. They can make all kinds of stuff, right? Well, <clears throat> suppose... Let's just imagine a goose for a second. Suppose you saw the shadow of a goose. What could you learn about the goose from his shadow? Well, you could say, well, he moves. Well, I think he has a head. I think he has long neck. I think he has wings. I think he has feet. How much would you know about the goose if all you ever saw of a goose was his shadow? You wouldn't know very much, right? You wouldn't know what color he was. You wouldn't know what his feathers actually looked like. Um, you, you would just know... It's alive. It's black and white. That's all I know. And many of the things for the Jews were like that. God had not revealed everything to them. Many things were known, but known only as shadows. And the real true thing they had not seen. Imagine what it would be like if you had only ever seen the shadow of a goose. And then one day somebody said, let me show you the real goose. And they took you into their goose barn and they showed you a real live goose with his little beady eyes and his little pinching beak and his beautiful colors and his feathers and his feet and his beautiful form and his shape and how he could spread his wings. You would be amazed, wouldn't you? The, the difference between seeing a real live goose in person and only seeing the shadow is, is incomparable. And you would see the splendor and the majesty and you would look in his eyes and know that it has some measure of intelligence and you would see its functionality and its gracefulness and its form it's so much better to see the real goose right than to see the shadow and we pick on the Jews because they didn't get it but you know a lot of their lives all they had had was shadows and one of these shadows that I'm going to explain now is this idea of sacrifice so in the Old Testament the people made sacrifices. They were participating in a practice that was like a shadow. They went through the ritual, they spread the blood on the altar, they went through the, the process that God commanded. But the reality that God was pointing to with that shadow was the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. And they hadn't seen that yet. So they're still 
looking at shadows. But one thing that happened when they made these sacrifices in the Old Testament is very important to understand, and the Jews would have understood this much better than we understand it, because we don't go to a temple and sacrifice animals today, but they did. They were still doing that in Jesus' day. And the Jews had a very strong concept of sin because they had the written law of Moses. They had the Ten Commandments. And so they had a clear understanding of what was breaking the law. And they understood that when they broke the law, it broke their relationship with God. It severed their relationship. It, God was now offended with them because of their sin. Suppose they stole something. Now they can't come into God's presence and have fellowship because there's a sin in the way. There's a sin in the middle between them and God. They've stolen something and now God is condemning them. They are under the judgment of God, not the blessing of God. God's face is not shining towards them. His face is against them. His favor is lost because they have broken God's law. In order to restore their relationship with God, there has to be a sacrifice of an animal. The blood has to be shed. So God's anger is kindled. God's preparing to judge them and punish them because they've stolen. They're, got, they're about to reap what they sowed. And the person maybe says, Oh, that was wrong. I sinned against God. Let me go tell God I'm sorry and ask him to forgive me. How would they do that? They would take an animal. They would go to the temple. They would lay their hands on the animal's head. The priest would kill the animal, take the blood, put it on the altar, and that blood would cover their sin, and God would cover their sin on the basis of that animal's blood until Jesus could come and take that sin away with his blood. God would cover it. He wouldn't look at it. And they could be restored in their fellowship with God. Now God's face could shine upon them again. God could bless them. The Jews were very conscious of this. It was deeply ingrained in their whole culture, this idea of blood sacrifice. It happened all the time. All the families did it. And this killing of animals, sprinkling of blood was an endless thing that they participated in at the temple. And they knew what, they knew what it was. And they understood that the penalty for their sin was paid for by the death of the animal. Now some of the sacrifices, there were many kinds. Some of them were what was called a whole burnt offering. They would take the lamb and kill it and they would burn the entire lamb on the altar. Everything would be consumed. But most of the sacrifices were not that way. Most of the sacrifices, what would happen would be, they would kill the animal, use its blood for the ritual of atonement, and then part of the animal would be burned on the altar. Well, in their mind, that was God's part. That's how God received his part. They burned it with fire, and the smoke went up to heaven. And so God received that part. The other part, they would eat. The priests would eat some of it, and they would eat some of it. They would cook it in different ways. Sometimes they would boil it. Sometimes they would roast it, however it was. But when a man came to the temple to offer a sacrifice of an animal... He brought his wife and his children with him. And they, at the temple, when this ritual of killing the animal was done, they would eat. They would, they would have a, a, a food. And how many of you remember the stories in the Old Testament about how the priest would get his part? Remember they had a boiling pot and he had a, a flesh hook of three prongs and he would dip it in and whatever it brought up, that was his part. So it was kind of like uh, chance of the draw. <laughs> if, if it was a nice big chunk, that was it. You know, if it was an eyeball, that was it. You know, I don't know what, what it brought up or, or what they put in there. But um, they were eating food. What did that represent? What did that represent that they ate part of this sacrifice? It represented them having a meal with God. Now my fellowship with God is restored. God and I can eat together again. Because all of Middle Eastern culture takes place around food and lingering over food and relating over food. And, uh, have, and, and you don't do that with your enemies. You do that with your friends. You do that with the people that you love and you care about. And so if my relationship with God is broken and now he forgives me and my relationship with him is restored... We show that by eating together. 
And so I burn part of my sacrifice on the altar and then I eat part of the sacrifice and now God and I are okay again. We're back in fellowship. And so this idea of eating a sacrifice, very well known to these Jewish people. That was not a mystery to them. That was not foreign to their culture. That was very uh, well understood. And so when Jesus is saying here, I'm giving my flesh for the life of the world, if anybody should have got the point, they should have got the point. <laughs> and when he goes on to talk about eating him, they should have been wise enough to realize, oh, we have a shadow of that in our culture. We, we practice that. When we bring sacrifices to God, we partake of the sacrifice after the ceremony is finished. And so when you put it in that context, it's not hard to understand what Jesus is saying. He's saying, you're going to have to partake of me. I'm the sacrifice. I'm the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. The sacrifice is my body. The bread that I give is my flesh. I'm giving my body. That's the sacrifice, and you have to partake of me. You have to partake of the sacrifice. But Jesus is speaking in spiritual terms. The way we partake of Jesus is spiritually, not physically. But he did give us the practice of the Lord's Supper, which we took this morning. The blood of Jesus represented by the wine. The body of Jesus represented by the bread. And I'll never forget reading the history of the Reformation. My Bible school teacher told us, if you really want to read a really good history of the Reformation, you read a book by this man. His, last, his name was D'Aubigny. And he wrote the history of the Reformation. And it was a big book. But I, I took up the challenge when I was in Bible school. I said, well, if he says that's the best, then I'm reading that. So I got it and I read it. And one of the things I've never forgotten is the fight that Luther had over whether the, the elements are really, truly Jesus himself or not. <laughs> and I'm not here to settle that debate. I just remember the furor <laughs> that was caused and people claiming each other were heretics and of the worst sort over this. It was, it was a big discussion and debate that they had. And um, because they, you know, Luther felt like he had to stand on the verse where Jesus said, this is my body, <laughs> and he wouldn't let go. So anyway, you'll have to sort that out between you and God, what you believe about that. But um, the point is here in this chapter that Jesus is saying, partake of me, the sacrifice, that the real bread that came down from heaven, and you partake by faith. You partake by, by believing. So it's hard to understand this passage unless we look at this shadow of sacrifice that was in the Old Testament. So what was Jesus doing by saying such things? I think he was driving away the foolish and insincere followers who didn't have worthy motives for following him. All they had was a desire to be fed. And Jesus couldn't build his kingdom on those desires. Was he driving them away permanently? No. He, these words were calculated to get them to think and get right motives. To come back to him with right motives. To go away, ponder, and realize, oh, it's not about this natural bread. They were still welcome to follow him. But not with the wrong motives. And so, you get to the end of the chapter. Many of them left and went back because they couldn't understand what he was talking about. And Jesus says to his 12 disciples, will you go away also? And Simon Peter answered him and said, Lord, to whom should we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that you are the Christ or the Messiah, the Son of the living God. So, Peter was strong in his faith. He believed that Jesus was the Messiah. He had assumed that the outcome would be the Romans would be defeated and that he was very wrong about that. But he was right in understanding that Jesus was the Messiah. And God helped him to figure that figure the rest out later after the Spirit of God came on the day of Pentecost. So we're going to close here today, end of chapter 6. But let's ask ourselves, let's apply this to ourselves by asking, what are my motives for following Jesus? Am I following him for the natural, earthly, physical benefits? 
You know, there's a lot of good that comes when we follow Jesus. We taste of peace and joy and, and love and uh, we get free from sin and, you know, there's all these pleasant blessings and benefits we have. But, but why are we really following Jesus and what would it take to convince us not to follow Jesus? We don't want to look down on these people who left too, too much. It didn't seem like it took more than a few strange words for them to stop following Jesus. They hadn't suffered anything yet. But Jesus says that following him will involve suffering. It will involve sacrifice on our part. So, why are you following Jesus? Why am I following Jesus? Is it for the earthly benefits? If God took away those earthly benefits, would we stop following Jesus like they did? We should ask ourselves those questions from time to time. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for being the true bread of life the true bread from heaven. We thank you for teaching us to partake of you by faith. We thank you for giving your body, your flesh, for the life of the world. We thank you for giving your flesh and blood in the Passover celebration at the Last Supper, giving us this uh, way to remember what you did through the Lord's Supper celebration. We had confessed that we're forgetful that we uh, fail to uh, fully appreciate all that's been given to us, that we uh, become negligent of important things, and we thank you for giving us this reminder. And we thank you for the weekly celebration of it here. Each week that reminds us that you did die and you did sacrifice yourself for us. We pray that you would help us to enter in more fully day by day to what it meant, what it does mean, that you died and sacrificed your life and that you call us to do the same. And Lord, that you would purify our motives, that we would follow you for the right reasons. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing hymn number 117. 117. Seventeen.
Thank you. You may be seated. We'll have our open mic time now. If you have a prayer request or a praise report, any news or birthdays, please feel free to come. <laughs> 